Mike, uh, a pleasure to have you on the, on the Leading Mind series. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, on the subject of time, over 40 years spent in, in finance, an uh, incredibly long, long period of time in, 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 in that industry. Tell me, what was your most memorable leader, leadership position over that time and why? Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to uh, to talk to you about this and uh, taking that first question on, um, which was, you know, what was the most memorable leadership position during that time? I think I'd probably refer to uh, a four year spell that I did uh, while I was working at Citigroup um, when I was running a global business, a global payments business for Citigroup uh, from the Dublin head office of that uh, entity. Uh, it was a global payment service, moving money around the world uh, to 140 countries worldwide um, for very large clients of the bank. You know, everything from major multinational corporations through to uh, public sector institutions and, and other large banks. And the reason it was memorable for me, it was the first time. And at the time I took up the appointment, I'd been working in the industry for 28, 29 years at that point. It's the first time that I've really and truly run a global business where um, the products and services that were being offered were being made available uh, or accessible in so many countries. But it was a, a business that, um, whilst heavily technology based, was still centered around people. So 550 employees um, across all the major time zones and regions of the world from North America and Latin America through the whole of continental Europe and uh, Middle East and Africa and out, of course, into the Asia Pacific region. So I had staff and different cultures, um, different colleagues working in all regions of the world uh, through all the time zones and working in a variety of different kind of functional roles. And another reason why it was memorable for me was that from a, an economic history point of view, if you um, cast your minds back to 2008 when we had um, the global financial crisis, the unfortunate global financial crisis, um, I took this particular role in 2010 and, um, you know, it was what, around about 18 months after the worst impacts and you had both our clients and also the countries we were trading in, particularly in the Eurozone, um, were you know really still recovering from that period of time. And for that business, it had received, um, you know, it had gone backwards a little bit in terms of its performance uh, in its revenue and profit terms. So the mandate I had was to effectively go in and you know run that business globally. I'd only prior to then really covered Europe, Middle East and Africa uh, in a series of roles that I'd done. So it was a bigger geographic expansion. Um, the largest uh, organisational unit I'd ever run ever, 550 people and, uh, you know, many, many different cultures and countries. And I think a position like that truly tests you as a leader, um, as a manager, um, and it tests you personally in terms of your character. So I think, you know, in summary, that that would be certainly definitely the, the, the most uh, valuable and memorable leadership experience for me. The mandate, the timing, the breadth and scope of the job. I can imagine. How long did you how long did you stay there for? Well, I was in Ireland for three and a half years of the four year stint and the final stint of the role. I moved back to London. Um, but during that time, Ireland was 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 very much my home base. So I was living outside Dublin, away from my family um, uh, at the time uh, because of uh, you know working conditions and the, my daughters were at university. So you have all that to manage in your life as well. Um, but yeah, I did three and a half years in Dublin, six months of the job remaining in, in, in London. But I was spending a great deal of time on, on an aeroplane, um, both in, in North America, where the bank's main headquarters were, but also across key European countries and, of course, into Asia as well. So it felt like I was hopping um, across a lot of time zones, a lot of countries and so on. So, yes, based out of Ireland, but very much a moving global job. Mm -hmm. Mike, over all of the roles you've held and the role and the roles that you you currently hold, what has been your most memorable mistake? So in terms of my most memorable mistake, um, I would say that um, one of the key things around um, leadership and in particular when you're running um, a business of a vast scale across time zones, across 
multiple stakeholders across different cultures. Um, and when you work in a business like I do, which is actually a very time critical business, i.e., you know, if you've got a client sending a payment from A to B, um, it's more often than not time critical that it gets from A to B on time. And it's a 24 seven operation and it's constantly uh, working, constantly working. And we always used to say that, you know, somewhere in the world, there was probably an issue affecting somewhere, having that, you know, um, satisfaction of a, of, of a customer somewhere in that, uh, in, in, in the world. We, and, we, and we saw that, for example, when we were managing very acutely in the wake of the financial crisis, both getting payments in and out of countries that were stressed financially, but also if you think about the Arab Spring period, um, you know, when you were sending, say, payments on behalf of a big global um, health agency and you're sending it into a country, say, impacted by unrest, you know, you have that sort of challenge to make sure that the service delivery happens and that the risk of it is eliminated. Now, um, coming back to the question, I just wanted to position that context with a job like that. When you're a global head of a business, you have to operate and be comfortable operating at a, a truly strategic level and having you know a clear vision having clear goals um you have to be able to offer operate um at an effective operational way and also really get in and understand the detail of the business because of the risk and i think i know you said what's the most memorable mistake i think what i um found was a constant challenge and something you really need to keep your uh you know you keep keep on top of was this ability to to switch between on the one hand thinking about your global goals thinking about the vision and articulating a vision and of course it's it's really important for a leader a key role of leadership is you're articulating a clear vision of where you're trying to take a business and getting people to buy in to that vision um and keeping the business broadly on track moving in that direction making sure that you're standing back regularly and saying in, in amongst all of the operational and tactical things going on, again, particularly in the context of a 24 seven business, it's very easy to get sucked into, um, you know, helping to solve problems or, you know, responding to somebody who's, you know, demanding urgent attention for you because an organizational culture, you know, demands that attention of you um, to keep that strategic focus. So I think it's not directly saying my most memorable mistake, but it was something that I constantly grappled with was getting the balance right in the strategic, the operational and the tactical domains. So how did you how did you improve that balance? How did you how did you improve it? How did you get to a position where you were able to maintain an appropriate balance between the three of them? Um, I think what I tried to do was I tried to give myself the time and the space um, every month to be reflecting back on um well what goals did i set myself this month what about the next 90 days and, and and because of the management processes you have in a large organization the way we did things at city was we would have a a monthly management business review so you would be presenting every month on the performance of your business and its achievement of rolling goals so adoption of that discipline was a key part of dealing with that um I think also um, in terms of getting better at it, there's no substitute for the experience and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and reviewing them. Um, you know, and, and you do make mistakes, you know, uh, any human being in any leadership situation, particularly if you are in a stress situation as well, stress leadership situation, you will make mistakes. And the important thing is both reflecting on them, but also when you see issues is escalating them, you know, it's not sitting on them, it's escalating them. So I think, you know, for me, um, it was a combination of experience. It was the combination of the preparation for articulating, um, you know, progress. Uh, and how I was going against goals, but also um, learning from mistakes and, and reflecting and of course getting feedback. The other thing, of course, about learning, you know, from mistakes and improving when you're in a global role, it's um, uh, there's, there's no place to hide. <laughs> you know, you are in the spotlight, totally in the spotlight. And uh, with that comes enormous pressure, but it also brings enormous satisfaction when you execute. So I think managing those highs and lows and being able to, um, you know, give yourself a time and space for reflection was very important for me. The, the reflection is a really important one. I'm glad you mentioned that. It's really important. And reflection, review, mm. if you want to put it in a more formal sense, um, people, and, and especially sort of the younger, younger, less experienced business people, entrepreneurs, business leaders, yeah. whether that's a one-man band or whether that's, you know, a couple of two or three employees or 
or on a much bigger scale. It can be, when you're very driven, I think it can be very, very difficult to see the value. And once you've achieved a goal, once mm. you've achieved the goal and seen the value in going, instead of moving on to your next goal and sort of and catapulting yourself onto that trajectory you want to be on, yeah. it's very important that you, you take a, a, a conscious decision to stop, review what has been done. Even if you've achieved that goal and you think it went swimmingly, to review what has been done and how you got there in order yeah. to become part of the planning process for the, the yeah. next part. And that's a really difficult thing to do because you've got yeah. momentum, you've got the goal done, your people are happy or they may not be happy, but you, even, if it's, if it, even if it's been a nightmare, you just want to move on to the next thing. But it's yes. that review, that reflection is so important. You yes. need to learn lessons from yourself and from other people. Yeah. You don't do that unless you analyze it. No, and, and um, I think so, the ability to do that. Um, uh, in, in the global organizations there's two other things i'd say around that process of reflection and having the time to do it is you need a trusted mentor an advisor or an advocate that is absolutely critical you need to have a safe haven a safe harbor person who you can talk to honestly and openly and get candid feedback and advice i think that's so important and i've learned that more and more as time has gone on um, the other thing I'd say as well is that the amount of stakeholder management in a big global organization, it's, it's until you've been in it, it's really hard to be able to convey um, how fundamentally important it is, but also how much time it soaks up, which takes me back to the point I was making earlier about this, this fine balance between the strategic leadership, including you know, that stakeholder piece versus also being in a position to help you know, resolve tactical and operational um, issues or you know be managing the day-to-day -day risks it really was you know you've all sorts of different regulators to talk to it, it's phenomenal phenomenal so but that reflection piece is so important Mike what can impact negatively impact a business more a poor relationship with your staff mm -hmm. or a poor relationship with the clients understanding that both are important but which do you think can impact negatively impact a business more OK, I, I mean, I think and uh, this may be a different view from those which I've heard expressed by others. I personally believe that you have to focus very hard on your clients and should focus very hard on your clients as a, the primary piece um, and an objective. Now, it doesn't mean to say that colleagues are not vitally important because they are. If you recruit the right people who have the right attitude, beliefs, behaviours, and motivations, they will go a long way to, to delighting your clients. The clients are the people who bring their business to you and they can go somewhere else if they're not happy with you. It's that real proof point moment about is what you're doing all coming together to both focus and deliver for those clients and make sure they're happy. Client satisfaction and the whole looking after your colleagues um, around that, that mantra is vital. Co colleague satisfaction is, is critical. And it's, it's almost like, you know, project number one, for me is clients priority number one and a half is colleagues it's it's that close but i do think that if you focus excessive energies and efforts on internal matters and on colleagues or other internal issues at the expense of your clients then you run the risk of of of, of devaluing your franchise and not being able to keep and grow you know grow your business and ultimately those colleagues depend on the business to be successful for them to be successful in their their life uh their well-being and their and their long-term wealth and happiness so there's a really really tight link between the two um I, I i can agree with perspectives that say that it's more important to keep colleagues happy or you know to satisfy them uh, than clients and I, and I get that perspective but for me and partly because of the culture of the organizations i've worked in i i i'd always put client first yeah i think maybe that 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 the importance of the two where you were saying you've got clients at one and staff at one and a half i think they become that close the bigger the organization gets i think the smaller the organ the smaller the organization then that gap between the importance of the looking after the client looking after the employee or staff member is a much bigger gap yeah i, I think maybe only because it's in terms of uh paying a uh, uh, paying attention and p putting attention to your employees. And I say that because when you're a smaller organization, it's yeah. much easier to keep your staff happy. It takes much less, much less resource, much less time, yeah. you know. Um, so yeah, on the subject, on, sorry. Uh, it, I was just gonna say, if, if you then consider that question 
across a multi-country, multi-jurisdiction business. That's when it becomes more complex, but it also becomes um, hugely satisfying when you get both of those dimensions right. Uh, and, and, you know, in my experience, the bigger the client, the more demanding they are, the more focus you need to put on them. But you also therefore need to make sure that that client centricity is right at the heart of the business or the organization. Um, but you cannot ignore in any way, shape or form colleague um, satisfaction uh, and colleagues being able to grow themselves and enjoy what they do. I mean, I, I've had the benefit of working within, you know, four major um regional or global financial service brands and they've all had different cultures uh slightly subtly different cultures and it's really great to have been through that because you get to see and pick a mix from the best of each um and 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 but i would repeat what i was saying earlier i think if my it's my personal opinion if you focus too much on internal issues and you lose sight of what why you're there why you're in business or why you're there to serve or to fulfill a mission then you will end up um, losing sight of looking after your clients and there'll be a nimble competitor. And of course, in our sector, we've got traditional competitors, but we've got the fintech players. They'll come in and they'll take take them off you. So really, really key balance. On the subject of relationships, you're in a, you, you're, you know, currently in an extremely demanding role. You've held a number of extremely demanding roles. Um, what aspect of your, your personal your personal life, your family life, has the most impact on your professional role, and and how do you and on the, on the flipping it, how do you manage your your family, your loved ones' expectations of you? How do you how do you do with both? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's a constant um, balancing act. Is the first thing I'll say uh, because I'm very fortunate. I've got a very close family around me. Uh, who I highly value. Um, I have enjoyed being a father, uh, you know, and seeing, you know, very young people grow up into young adults and, and, and achieving their potential. And on the one hand, you like to think, well, hopefully the efforts I put into my work and the opportunities that has created for them has, you know, paid off and, and, and been of value. But I also think moving away from, and, 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 and this is, I know everybody struggles with this, whatever, you know, walk of life, they, anytime you go into a kind of demanding role, that there's a constant juggling or balancing act in getting the balance right. And I, I think as I've got um, older, um, although I don't look as old as my career length might say, imply that I am, but uh, as I think older, the, the, the gift of time and time spent and focus, I, I felt, you know, more and more was important. And um, I think that's the thing I would criticise myself the most on is that probably in the midst of my career, in my 30s and 40s in particular, did I get that balance right between pursuing my career, um, you know, uh, providing for my family, which was very, very important to me, but also was I, was I giving enough time during those, those, those years where time is very, very important when, when your kids are around, you know, when your family are around. Uh, so that, that's a constant battle and, you know, it's still there. It's just because, you know, when your kids grow up, for example, it doesn't mean to say it goes away because you, you should still be there to be a sounding board, an advisor, a mentor and someone to help guide, guide through life. I mean, my parents from a different generation and you know, I started work when I was 17 and it was almost like, great, off the books now, you know, go on, go make your life. And that's that's how it was. It was you had very, very little time um, with your with, in my generation of parenting anyway that, that, that I had. Um, you have very little time being given into you for that. And I and I was felt and I felt that more and more recently. If only I knew what my parents would have known, what would I have done differently off the back of that as a leader and as a person? Um, and how can I sort of almost correct for that now with my kids? So how can I be uh, more you know, generous of my time with them to help advise them and support them without you know, being too intrusive, if that makes sense? So I, th I think to summarise on the question, um, it's a constant battle. Um, you know, I have a very supportive family around me. I'm extremely lucky with that. And I could never have achieved what I've done in my business career, uh, my, my, my career and, and grown as a personal leader without them. It would have just not happened. I know that. And that's why it's absolutely massively important to keep that balance. Yeah, it's interesting that that, that, you've, that things in the professional life of, of, of in terms of relationship wise, the way you manage things have positively impacted your, your family life. It makes me think, I think it's similar with me, especially in the last 
the last year or so where I've been working very much at, you know, um, and it's taught me, I don't know how it's come about, but it's taught me that the huge importance of, of, of having a conscious switch either from, you know, family time, personal time into right work mode, if you like, and then work mode and back out and, and dedicating all of your focus into whatever, whatever yes. you're doing, be that in, at work or be that spending time yeah. with my girls or spending time with my missus. Um, it, it's definitely helped me, the, the professional side definitely helped me see the value in shutting things off. It doesn't matter how much how much pressure you got going on, how yeah. complex tasks are, because you can focus much better on the task at hand, be yeah. that your relationship with your family or be that your relationship with your, your clients and your staff and your, and your work. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and it's a you know tremendous. There's a, t a tremendous battle. I, I've met a lot of single people with no families in in my career actually in certain echelons of the organisations I've worked in, and they I've seen people totally 100% devoted on their careers. And if that's what they want to do, and 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 that's their you know area of of, of priority, then that's that's cool. Um, equally, back I, I completely agree with what you've just said. You have to be really disciplined with your time and compartmentalise it. Again, you learn that as, as time goes on. I would definitely say I was poor at doing that and not having an intrusion of work into my private life and family life in my 30s and 40s, to be honest, because there was immense pressure. And when you particularly work for a, a global organization, um, they look after you really well. You know, they do really look after you well, but also they they want they want 100 percent focus. So it's a it's a constant battle. Yeah, maybe it's what it's similar to the review reflection kind of thing. It's it's seeing the value in it's being able to see the value in uh, you're taking the time to not push on with the task and do that review, that reflection for the planning. And yeah. In the same way, it's seeing the value in switching off, taking your mind away from all that stuff, yeah. focusing on what needs to do. Because if, I mean, that's why it's called a work-life balance, right? The balance is off, then the opposite is affected. That's not getting the attention. Yeah. No, that's right. Um, finishing off, last, last, last question for you, an important one to me. Um, what do you feel is the most important quality in a leader, well, in, a success, in a successful leader, <laughs> in a successful leader. Oh, okay, yeah. um, no, I think we're not that, we're not talking Mugabe or anything like that. Okay, uh, no, no, definitely not. Um, so I think in terms of the quality of a of a successful leader, that it, and you're trying to say what's the singular most important quality, I think um, learning by doing. Is, is one really important quality, a really important quality, which is you have to be able to take and have confidence in yourself to take a risk sometimes to try things out and not be afraid of failure. I think that's a really vital thing. You have to do the right things around your own due diligence when you're going to execute something in a in a business capacity. And in my industry, obviously, compliance and regulation is vital. So you've got to work within those parameters, but leading by doing and having the confidence and the self-belief to, you know, weigh things up and then back yourself and back your judgment and then execute decisively, I think is really, really important to me as a, and, and passing that on as an insight. There's loads of behavioral qualities that are important. I happen to believe that people being authentic uh, as leaders and also um, not asking colleagues, subordinates, peers, to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. I think that's a vital quality, that's behavioral. But in terms of the kind of the execution of being, you know, a highly effective leader, I think that learning by doing and backing yourself and having the confidence to try uh, around and then execute decisively and not, you know, get involved in an in analysis paralysis is, is absolutely critical. Yeah, the the learning by doing is absolutely you've got to you've got to take risks to succeed, but you also have to be wrong to yeah. learn yeah. so uh, and uh, and it, it it also ties in with the, the authenticity side of things um uh, and that sorry not authenticity sort of integrity being op open with yourself and understanding that exactly like you're saying taking a risk and getting it wrong it, there's yeah. there's absolute value in it there's absolute yeah. value in it because you've invariably learned something to be able to move forward yeah. your knowledge has improved and the, yeah. and in the same way, it may impact the business, but the business learns from it as well. Yeah. And you build resilience, and and yeah. you can go forward stronger. Yeah, I, I thought you know it's great, isn't it? Very topical today. You see, Captain Tom Moore, hundredth birthday today. What he's here has done is set an example of leadership by 
taking a challenge and, and showing others, leading the way, showing others right and not being afraid to do it. And I just think it's one of the best simple examples of, of, of good leadership and authenticity. If I'm Colonel, Colonel so Tom Moore. Now. Colonel, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, honorary Colonel Tom Moore. Happy birthday. <laughs> Mike, on that note, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time. Likewise. I appreciate it. Thank you Great. very much.